Yes, so that it is more clear, okay? I have never learned Tibetan, but I hear the Tibetan language is very difficult. And so I just want to say, for those of you who speak Tibetan, feel free to say, Allison, please stop. We don't know what you're talking about. Okay, great. Glad we're on the same page. So I just wanted to start by inviting everyone to stand up. Just standing up in your seat. And if that's not possible for you, finding a comfortable seat. As you're standing here, just notice if you have a desire to talk to the person next to you. Notice maybe how you're feeling in this moment. And just take an opportunity right now to listen to your body and listen to the signals your body is sending. So right now, just taking a deep breath in, feeling that breath, then a deep breath out. And let's just do it one more time. Take a deep breath in. And a deep breath out. And as you breathe in again, just noticing any sounds and breathing out. And then I'm just going to invite you to tense your whole body. So making your body as tight as possible. So very, very tight. Tighten your mouth. Make your face look like a dry fruit, like a raisin. And your stomach, tighten your stomach and your legs, everything as tight as you can, your shoulders, five and four and three and two and one, drop. Just noticing how that feels. Sometimes, in order to relax, it can be helpful to become tense first. So let's do it one more time, just tightening as much as you possibly can. Notice if you are laughing or crying. Three and two and one, welcome, drop. So just noticing whatever thoughts may be coming up right now, maybe your mind has already drifted to somewhere else. And in this moment, as you sit down, notice what does your body do to sit down practice? How do you get into your chair? So as you come into your chair, notice, do you move your legs? Do you put your hands on the chair? What do you do to get into your chair? Because not everyone can stand and sit. And it is something to be grateful for that we can actually stand and sit down. So as you sit, taking a seat right now, just noticing what you do. So in this moment, just notice where your body is touching your chair. Maybe notice the feeling of your hand. Where is your hand touching your leg? letting your body settle here. So in this moment, before I talk more about the exercise, I just want to invite all of you to participate in an experiment. Here is the experiment. Recent research shows that the average person in this country checks their cell phone at least 150 times every day. At least. Raise your hand if you think it's probably more than that. More than 150 times, okay? So you've got some for that. So each of these moments that we are checking our cell phone is a moment when we are not doing something else. We're not paying attention to our child. We are not listening to a friend talk about what they're going through in their heart. We're not actually paying attention to where we're walking. Each of these moments is a moment of divided attention. So the invitation is to experiment with putting your phone on silent or turning it off and of course, if you have a sick family member, if there's an emergency, or you know maybe you're, you have a child at home, you need to check your phone, that's totally fine. But there's also research that shows for many people, the cell phone has become like an additional arm or an additional leg. So when people feel, where's my cell phone? Oh my gosh, I lost my arm. That's how it feels in the body. So one invitation is to remove your cell phone from your body. If your cell phone right now is on your body, take it off, put it in a bag, put it under your chair, give it to me, I'll take care of it for the next hour. So right now, just take 10 seconds and make a decision about your cell phone. 10 seconds. If you do choose to turn it off, just an invitation to notice how many times during this presentation, do you think, oh, I wonder who texted me? I wonder who emailed me? Just notice how often that comes up, because it's a 
maybe you're hoping that something changes by January. Who knows what you're thinking about right now? So just noticing what's coming up for you in this moment. The essence of mindfulness is paying attention moment to moment to what's happening in your experience. And there are going to be more people coming in throughout this presentation, and that's also a great mindfulness opportunity. Notice what happens. The mind goes, I want to see, is it my friend? Do I know them? And also, in part, why this happens is because we want to know we're safe. Someone's coming in. Is this person safe? And so the mind also goes to see who's coming in through the door. Just keeping that in mind. In this presentation, I'm going to provide a more detailed explanation of mindfulness. What is mindfulness really? It's a word that is being used all over the place now. And when I first started practicing mindfulness, it was not common, and I had to explain it to every single person I met. But now it's being used in mainstream media all over the place. So I'm going to talk more about what is mindfulness, and then I'll talk about what research shows about why mindfulness practice is really beneficial to people of all ages, from small children all the way to 99 or 100. And I'm going to guide you through some mindfulness practices that you can use in your day-to-day -day life as a parent or a caregiver, caregiver meaning nanny. So I just want you to think of this presentation as an introduction to mindfulness for you. And Many people who are at this workshop today have heard the word mindfulness before. Maybe some of you have attended a mindfulness presentation or workshop before. Just a hand if you've ever done anything related to mindfulness. Anyone? Great. So I see quite a few people. And just an invitation to you if you have learned about mindfulness before. It's been very interesting for me. Every time I go to a presentation on mindfulness, take a class, a week-long silent retreat, every time I do that, the teacher in front of me, every different teacher explains things in a different way. And each time, something hits me that I did not understand before. And every day when I meditate in the morning, my definition of mindfulness changes. So see if you could sort of listen with fresh ears and fresh eyes and see what happens as you're so, a little more on what mindfulness is. I just want to start with a story. A few years ago, a mindfulness teacher of mine shared that she was spending some time with her grandmother and her grandmother's friends. Her grandmother was about 85 years old. They're all sitting together, and she's a mindfulness teacher. And her grandmother said, will you please teach mindfulness to me and to my friends? We're 85. We're ready to learn mindfulness. Okay, sure. Let's do some mindfulness. And they did a very short exercise focusing on the breath, going through the body, which we will do in a little while. So at the end of this exercise, one woman raised her hand and she looked very shocked. Very, very shocked. And she was also in her 80s and she said, Wow, I just realized I did not. I was walking around, I was going to work, I was raising children, and most of the time my mind was in the future or in the past, and I did not even realize that my mind was there. And it was everywhere except for here in this moment. I'm 85, and most of my life I did not live it. Now I just want to that to start off a clear explanation of what mindfulness is. Similarly, I taught an introductory mindfulness workshop to a group of high school teachers because before, well, now I work coaching teachers in different public schools. I coach teachers, I coach administrators, and then I also teach mindfulness in different capacities. But at that time, I was teaching a mindfulness workshop to some of my colleagues. And the next Monday, one of the teachers came to me, and she's a new mother. She had a small baby, and she said, oh my gosh, Allison, you will not believe what happened over the weekend. I said, tell me. She said, so I was sitting holding my baby, John, and I suddenly woke up and realized Instead. 
instead, my mind was far away. I was planning my lessons for next week. I was worrying. I was thinking about this and thinking about that. And all John was doing was coupling in my arms. And then she said to me, how many moments with my baby have I already missed? The mindfulness session allowed me to realize that I know this time, John's babyhood is going to pass so quickly, and I want to actually be present for as many moments of it as I possibly can. And just finally on that note, I also teach young people, teenagers in different high schools around the city, and one ninth grader said to me, Ms. Cohen, before this class, this mindfulness class, I didn't know I was thinking when I was thinking. And what do I do if I have a thought that is very threatening? How do I understand that? Also, one thing I was very confused by is I knew I had so many good things in my life. Wonderful parents, friends who cared about me, and yet so much of the time my mind was going to the negative. Sometimes I would feel very angry, like, I, I know I should be happy, but I'm not happy. And yet, I, would, I didn't have access to these tools. And so in my early 20s, I went through a very, very difficult period. And I was doing everything in my power to not be with myself. I was socializing a lot. I was doing so many different activities, volunteering, etc. And then finally, I got fed up. And I said to myself, the one place I want to be able to feel at home is inside this head and heart. If I am not safe in here, where will I be safe? And so what ended up happening is that another teacher at the high school said to me, oh, just go on a silent retreat. So I went on a retreat, and I realized, oh, this is what I needed. I need a method for how to be with whatever is arising moment to moment, joy, pain, other moments, rather than immediately running away from things that are challenging or saying, Oh my gosh, I must have I must have a mental problem. And I'm having a challenging feeling, so this means I must go to the doctor immediately. What would it be like to learn how to be with what comes up moment to moment? So the reason I teach mindfulness is because these are the skills I wish I had as a child. I wish I had them as a teenager. I wish I had them in my first year of teaching. And at the end of that first retreat, that I wanted to share this work at some point. So, the one thing I want to say is all of us have experienced moments of mindfulness. Mindfulness is paying attention in a certain way to whatever's happening in your experience. So what I mean by a certain way is acknowledging what's happening with kindness, openness, curiosity. Oh, this is what's happening in my experience. Rather than getting pulled into the past or the future about what's happening. 
must be an anxious person. I must be an anxious person. I have tension in my chest. I'm anxious. It's very difficult in the United States to have an experience and not have it immediately be accompanied by a judgment. This happens. What does this mean about me? It means I'm this kind of person and this kind of person and this kind of person. What would it be like to unglue the judgment and the experience? So we're constantly changing, and yet often we believe I am I don't know if you've ever seen at the end of a DVD, sometimes they'll show a scene from a movie and then the director of the movie will talk over the DVD. Have you seen that before? It's like a person is talking over a movie. And there's a great psychologist who writes that this is what happens to us. This is what we're doing all the time. We talk over the movie of our lives by having commentary, opinions, judgments, when we're mindful, we stop the commentary and give our full attention to what is actually happening and get to experience the fullness and richness of this moment. So the truth is that we can actually be mindful of anything in our experience. And I just want to share one example from a young person, a high school student. She took an eight-week mindfulness course and then she said, I was having a scary moment and it involved my mother. My mother was going through a very scary thing, a health problem. I was panicking and crying, and I used mindfulness to calm down, to come back to the moment, and make the decision about what to do next. As a result, I was able to help my mother because I could be really present with what the moment needed. Mindfulness is ultimately a practice that helps us to realize each person in this room is your own so that we can make appropriate decisions. And I am more of a visual person, and so I just want to move on to the next slide. Um, this is the slide that really helped me understand mindfulness. So for many people, especially parents and caregivers, this is what happens without mindfulness. A trigger comes in, for example, I'll give a parenting example, the three-year-old throws food on the, floor, on the floor. Reaction, how many times do I have to tell you not to do that? With mindfulness, the trigger comes in, the child throws the food on the floor, and, oh, I'm aware, my fists are clenching. I'm aware that my body's tightening and my jaw is clenching. And I'm aware that words are coming to my tongue. Or response, 
I'm eating instead. Maybe I'll call my friend. Mindfulness can help us tune into what is actually happening that's leading us to behave in the way that we're behaving. So the first one, this is what's interesting, is many human beings, this is what it's like. Push a button, get the same response every time. It's like being a robot. Push this button. So here's a very common one. Your, your husband or wife comes in late from work. Reaction, honey, again? Trigger, the husband or wife comes in late from work. Mindfulness, eyes start rolling back, <laughs> noticing the tension. Response, honey, I feel sad. We haven't seen each other at all this week. I really love spending time with you. Tomorrow night, can you take some more time? Naming our own feelings. Or, I'm really happy to see you. You must have had a really hard day at work. Or, <laughs> So some of you have probably already planned what you're going to say. You're 
you already think, okay, I'm aware of this, I'm aware of this, I'm aware of this. <laughs> See if you can just let that go. It's likely what you're aware of now is gonna be different in a little while. And I'd love for you to just try to be fully present. When it's your turn to speak, really listen to yourself. And when the other person is speaking, notice if your mind is going to other things or you're going, okay, it's almost my turn, so I have to think about it now and plan. Just relax into fully listening. And if there's a moment of silence between you and your partner, become curious about how you relate to the silence. Does it make you feel comfortable, uncomfortable, or some other way? In mindfulness practice, the golden rule is every moment is an invitation to learn more about your experience. So, on your mark, get set, decide who's gonna go first, the other person or people will listen, fill in I'm aware three times, then take a breath together, and then the other person will go. Have fun. <laughs> Yeah. 
you have seen it before. Have you found it helpful? Yeah. You found it helpful, that's great. Yeah, this is really, really beneficial. Let's say, here's the story of a mother. She was out with her daughter, and they were shopping together, and she started to feel like, my child is being so annoying. Why is my kid acting like this? This is so ridiculous. She should stop behaving this way. But she was taking a class with me, and she had just learned whole. And she said, okay, okay. Am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I? And she realized, again, they hadn't eaten. And she said to her daughter, let's go eat something. And so they went together, they ate something. And she said, the mother told me this story. She said, and suddenly, I was not annoyed at my child anymore. It turned out my child wasn't really doing anything so bad, but I was hungry. And so I interpreted it that way. And this could also be, you notice your mind going to, I want to quit my job, I hate my life. And then you go through this list, oh wow, last night I only got three hours of sleep. I was up watching the election results. Oh, when people are really tired, they are more likely to have depressive thoughts. So this can really help us check in and learn how to take care of ourselves. Oh, I'm at work, I'm feeling really lonely. Oh, maybe I'll call someone or hug my coworker. Or right now, you could hug the person next to you. Just kidding, we don't all know each other. But <laughs> let me do that. Okay. So there's one thing that I think is really important for me to say right now before we continue. The most common question I get is, Allison, are you saying we should never think about the future and we should never think about the past? No. We are still alive. We are we're able to think. This is incredible. But the question is, do you know you're thinking about the future when you're thinking about the future? Do you know you're thinking about the past when you're thinking about the past? So here's an example. Let's say we're having a conversation. We're talking. And then in the conversation, I don't realize my mind is going to all different things. And then I say, oh, sorry, what did you say five minutes ago? That's a time when my mind was going to the future or going to the past, and I didn't know it. All I need to do is be present. <coughs> That's different than this. I have my calendar, I'm planning my week, I'm thinking about the future. I know I'm thinking about the future, I'm choosing to think about the future, I need to think about the future. That is a deliberate choice. That's different. Or, for example, I have written a journal since I was 14 years old. Reflecting, oh, this happened this week, I noticed this is what happened for me, I want to learn from this so next time I do it differently. If you're thinking about the past and you're choosing to think about the past and write about it, and learn from it, great. But that's different than eating a whole meal, thinking about what happened yesterday, then you look down, oh, I didn't taste one bite of this food. So that's a very different circumstance. Do we know we're thinking when we're thinking? Where is the mind? So as a result of all of this, what brain research shows is that for people who do not practice mindfulness, you are not living your life 47% of the time. Brain research shows that 47% of the time, your mind is somewhere else and you don't know it is somewhere else. That means 53% of the time you're really experiencing your life and 47% you're not. But you can shorten that with mindfulness practice, with practicing coming back again and again right now, feeling your feet on the floor, feeling your clothing on your skin, noticing if you're thinking, how long is this presentation going to go? Really just checking in. Maybe you're judging yourself or judging me. Just paying attention with this kind curiosity. What is coming up right now? And just so you know how long it will go, we'll probably be, because we started about 15 minutes late, I'm going to talk for another 10 minutes or so, and then I'll take questions. And if at any point you need to leave, know that you are not offending me. This is New York City. So people have very crazy schedules. So I understand that. Don't worry about it. Um, what I want to say is that showing up in awareness takes training. And there's been so much research on the benefits of mindfulness training. One of them is this. If you take a look at this oops, picture on the screen, you'll see a crazy word up there for people. Well, actually, it doesn't matter if you're a native English speaker or not. The word, the this is a part of the brain, shown here in red, the amygdala. So we're just gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going back into being an English teacher, but just so everyone feels comfortable, let's just say it once together. The word is amygdala, right? One, two, three. 
Um, you need to fill it out. Great. Awesome. So, what is this? This is one of the oldest parts of the brain. It is designed to keep us safe. For example, it's designed to keep us safe from a bear that we think is going to attack us. Let's say a bear came into the room right now. The amygdala, which is it's only about the size of an almond, this almond-shaped part of the brain is responsible for sending us signals that we may be in danger. And this is also known as the fight, flight, freeze response. So what's been found is that if you practice mindfulness, this part of the brain actually shrinks in size so that you have more of a choice about how you respond to things and are less likely to constantly be in a state of fear. But this is the thing. Because all of us have this part of our brain, when your two-year-old or the two-year-old you're caring for throws a tantrum in your body and in your mind, you may still experience it as if a bear was attacking you. So you imagine the little kid, they're screaming, they're yelling, they're throwing things in your body. So the signals, it's like, are you a bear trying to attack me? That's how it can feel in the body. The awareness, can anyone relate to that? That it can feel that way? Okay. So this awareness of how your system is being affected by the outburst creates space. Oh, I notice that these are all the ways I'm responding to this. This part of the brain is responding in this way, etc. Can you take a deeper breath than me? Two feet. It's something that you can use. And so we live in this world that's full of all of these different things that make us feel stressed out. In a culture that encourages us to look outside of ourselves for answers, there's actually nothing more radical or necessary anyone in this room can do 
than paying non-judgmental kind attention to what's happening right now with you as the body and mind send constant signals. Mindfulness and child trauma expert Chris McKenna explains that reptiles are born like a, a lizard has a fully formed nervous system, but a child does not. Human babies are not born with a fully formed nervous system. And the development of a human's nervous system or a human's ability to self-regulate is informed and influenced by the nervous system of the adults he or she comes in contact with. When a baby cries and cannot calm down, and an adult picks her up, it really matters if the adult's nervous system is regulated or dysregulated. Does she receive calm, grounded signals that translate into her own ability to self-soothe? Or the opposite? Our young people, whether toddlers, fifth graders, or teenagers, are influenced moment to moment by how we relate to each other and to them. It's important for us as caretakers and role models to recognize, this is what Chris McKenna says, our nervous systems are the intervention for our children. And the more we can figure out how to stay regulated, the better off our kids will be. And I saw this in high schools. I taught all the students who had serious challenges, academic, behavioral, etc. And people were constantly asking me, in your room, why are they so calm? Why are they doing, why are they passing the exam that they failed four or five times before having to go as a teacher? And it was hard for me to explain it. And it was only years after that I realized I'm the only teacher in the building who's meditating every morning before school. I'm the only teacher in the building who before every class is going, I am aware. I am aware that yesterday I had a negative interaction with this child. And it's important to notice how much of a difference this can make. So right now, we're going to do, for about three minutes, a formal mindfulness practice, also known as mindfulness meditation. Raise your hand if you've ever done any form of meditation before, any kind of meditation practice. Anybody? Okay, so we've got some folks. Awesome. No, perfect. And what I'm going to be doing is leading you through this, and I just want to explain one quick thing. So far, you have learned Two feet, one breath. You have learned halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. You have learned I am aware, I am aware, I am aware. These are things you can do throughout the day. But how will you be able to know that you need to do that? Well, if you really hope, if every day you carve out even one minute to practice building this muscle of being able to come back again and again to what's happening in my experience. And that's called mindfulness meditation. You can do it on the subway. A little difficult, but you can do it. Mindfulness meditation or formal mindfulness practice. I'll be guiding us through. If you've done something like this before, see if you can experience it as, as a fresh thing. So right now in your seats, just take a moment and stretch in whatever way feels good. So often we're sitting all the time, so just giving ourselves a chance to stretch. And then, because many of us, as a result of being on our phones and computers, are like this a lot, taking your hands and just giving yourself for a moment just a little self-massage, especially where your neck meets your shoulders. Great. Anybody notice there's some pain there? Yeah. Yep. So in a minute, we're going to get in a line and massage each just kidding. Okay. <laughs> In a moment, we're going to let this room be totally silent. So right now, notice how you're feeling. And just allowing yourself to stop talking, putting your hands somewhere that's comfortable for you, sitting in a comfortable position that's also awake. And one thing, for your eyes, if you are very, very sleepy, you may want to keep your eyes open and just find a point on the Just 
relaxing your jaw, seeing if you can let your shoulders relax just a little bit more. And in our culture, many of us are taught to hold our stomachs in very tight. See if you can allow your stomach to relax, just breathing naturally, expanding and contracting.
does this with her friends. When they sit together, they go back and forth, especially if they're going through a difficult time and they do this. What's one good thing that's happening in your life? Why don't you tell me one good thing? I have a wonderful husband. Wonderful husband, great. And you would ask me, what's one good thing? I love to dance and I went to a great dance class. What's another thing? And we can go back and forth like this. A little game, you can do it with children. What's one thing that you love? What's one thing that makes you happy? And it's a way to help them start to train their brains to strengthen their ability to notice the positive. Also, number three, whenever possible, try to see people in your life through new eyes. It's very easy to think, I know this person, I know that person. They will always be that way. But there's only one truth in life. It's that things are constantly changing. Constant, for example, I never thought I would have gray hair. But I've been looking at myself in the mirror recently I've been finding gray hair. And I thought, oh wow, who knew? I thought this can't be happening. I'm not having, there, there can't be gray hairs on my head. And then I thought, oh my gosh, this is the only truth in life. Things are constantly changing. So I can fight the change or I can go, the gray hair shows maybe I'm becoming wiser. I don't know, we'll see, okay? So let's go through this. When we think we know someone, we are no longer in relationship with a living, changing being. Rather, we are now in relationship with an idea of that person. So for example, I, I've gone through times where I thought I knew someone in my family, and then they did something, and I thought, that's not how you should act. But who are they? They are a constant changing person. Can we tune in all the time to the way, oh, this child is changing and growing. I'm changing and growing. Let's support each other as we both change. So noticing when you think, well, you shouldn't act like that because yesterday you acted differently. Well, the only truth is change. Four, very important. Try to be forgiving and compassionate towards yourself for your perceived shortcomings as a parent or caregiver. Many of us are very hard on ourselves. Once my mom said to me, Allison, I want to apologize for not being the perfect mother. I made so many mistakes. And I said, Mom, I don't need a perfect mother. I need you to be you. And I realized she had spent so many years beating herself up for not being the perfect mother. And I remember, I, I, there are a few moments in my life where I remember her doing something in parenting and then she would say like, that was so stupid. And once I said to her, mom, you're human. We're human. And part of the way we can model for children self-forgiveness is by forgiving ourselves for Part of life. How we deal with the mistakes we make is a model for our children. Number five, learn more about mindfulness. No! No!
Choice. How will we use the time in our day? And I will tell you, 